Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome from a, a beautiful autumn morning here in Joburg. Uh, I hope wherever you are that you also have a, a fantastic day. I know we've got some people dialing in from across the country. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Theo Duplessis. I'm from the Structured Lending Team based in Johannesburg. And uh, today I'm joined by my colleague in, in, uh, from the Structured Lending Team based in Durban, uh, Paul Hasler. Um, NetBank Private Wealth also have uh, teams based in Cape Town, uh, Pretoria, Bloemfontein and, and then a number of other smaller uh, agencies, if you will, across the country, uh, you know, to ensure that we can reach our clients um, wherever they are. Um, but for today, uh, Paul and I will be talking to you. Um, this is really around um, NetBank Private Wealth's unique approach to financing commercial and uh, industrial property. Um, yeah, and, and, and maybe just some housekeeping before we start. Uh, you'll notice that it, uh, the webinar is being recorded. Um, there's a Q&A chat box on the left side. Um, so please submit some questions during the webinar. Um, you know, this is a smaller group, it's, uh, it's uh, intentionally so, so that we can uh, answer all questions. Um, if your screen happened to freeze, uh, just press the refresh button, it will take you back to where you uh, stopped uh, last in the webinar. Um, we'll also send you an email afterwards um, in the next few days, you know, with a link to the recording. So you can, uh, if we interested you that much, you can, you can look at it again or you can share it with somebody else. Um, yeah, and, and please also remember that you can get more thought leadership insights and recordings of, of previous webinars on our website and, and you'll also find some information about uh, future um, discussions that we will be having. Um, and then uh, lastly, just, uh, you know, your, your views are very important to us, so uh, please help us to improve our future webinars by giving your feedback. Um, there will be a short survey at the end of the um, webinar, so uh, uh, yeah, um, we'll, we'll appreciate your feedback on that. Now, um, all right, let's get into this. Uh, uh, Paul Haslow um, hosted a webinar late uh, April um, that really focused around um, the state of the property sector uh, uh, as a large uh, sort of industry. Um, he, he had some very uh, clever and uh, well-respected um, uh, panel members, um, but we got so many questions during that session that that we simply couldn't um, answer all of them. Um, you know, hence the the reason for this discussion. And and so, so today is really to 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 take questions, live questions. <laughs> we'll we we hope we can answer them for you, um, but also. Uh, to provide you to provide you with insight on on, on how NetBank Private Wealth um, looks at deals um, and and considers property finance, you know, and and what do we look for when we finance a property? Because I, th I think if you understand that, um, you'll you, you'll have a much better idea of uh, of what we can do for you. Um, so yeah, uh, let's let's maybe first start. You know, one of the, the sort of the, I suppose, the starting point in terms of questions that we get is, is what type of, of assets um, uh, will NetBank Private Wealth finance for you um, or gear for you, um, if you like. So, so first of all, in, in no particular order, you know, we, uh, we, we, we through our Net, NetBank Private Wealth stockbroking business, we will um, provide carry accounts, uh, which is really nothing else than um, an overdraft, if you will, um, uh, against listed share portfolios. You know, so not only will we um, deal in your shares, we will uh, manage it for you, we will um, advise it for you, uh, provide you with advice on it, but we will also gear it. So we will, we, we, are, we are able to lend you against that um, uh, portfolio of shares. And, and as a rule of thumb, it's around 50%, but you know, it's a rule of thumb. It, it depends on the on the underlying investments, you know, so um, uh, yeah. Then um, we will gear or lend against uh, investments that are held or managed uh, locally by NetBank Private Wealth or internationally by NetBank Private Wealth. 
We, um, we, we have representative offices in London, um, the Isle of Man, Jersey, Guernsey, and the, and the UAE. And, and it's possible for us to lend you in, in South Af good old South African rand um, against your, your foreign investments. You know, so um, I don't think too many people are aware of that. Um, and, and it could be cash investments or your foreign um, uh, listed portfolios, you know, share portfolios um, or any other type of investment that, that we're comfortable with. But the, the, the main thing is we can get those investments for you. Um, we then also provide vehicle finance through our bankers. We do home loans on, on uh, primary residences for our, our clients. But I, but I think today's focus is, is really on the income producing properties. Um, like we like to call it, um, you know, so that would be investment residential properties, you know, where you, you, you the, the good old buy to let. Um, uh, yeah, so as an asset class, that's that's the first um, income producing property that we will finance. We will also look at um, industrial and, and, and warehouse type properties, uh, you know, they, they're doing um, fairly well, I think, uh, came out of uh, the previous property webinar. Um, if you dialed in, you know, those properties are still fairly popular at the moment. Um, we'll do retail centres, you know, be it both uh, rural or urban. Um, and, you know, uh, from the smaller to the bigger stuff. Um, and, and then lastly, uh, but definitely least, I think at the moment is is office space. You know, it's it's certainly not the flavour of the year, let alone the flavour of the month at the moment. But but it uh, you know it's it's a tendency at the moment, and uh, the market will definitely turn. So 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 those are the four main um, uh, property types that we will finance: investment, residential industrial warehousing type, uh, retail centers, um, and, and office space. Um, agricultural property, uh, I see a question. Um, agricultural property is specifically financed through our, our um, business banking division, you know, so uh, uh, you can contact us. We'll gladly put you in touch with them, but uh, it's They've got um, specialist uh, agricultural teams. Um, you know, it's assessed as a business um, that just happens to be on a farm, I suppose. But yeah, um, NetBank definitely finances um, agricultural property. It's just done through our, our business banking um, division. So right, um, now that we've dealt with what we will finance, I think let's have a look at, at um, how do we assess um, uh, these income producing uh, uh, properties when we get a request. So so uh, I always say, you know, if a, if a friend of yours asks you to, to lend him some money, uh, the, the first question you should probably ask him is, how are you going to repay me? Um, and, and banks are no different. Uh, you know, that's, that's the first thing we want to know. We want to know how you're going to repay me. Uh, read by us, I should say. Um, the, the the only difference is it goes a bit further. We need to to establish and to prove how much you can repay, and and over what period. So so yeah, the 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 first thing we will always look at um, is the ability to to repay. So, so 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 let's start at the basics. I mean, any any income producing property um, will receive gross rent. Um, and, and, and that gross rent, um, I must point out, uh, we will only look at market related gross rent. We have seen um, at the moment, uh, you, you know, there is um, some regression in the market uh, on, on the rental uh, that can be charged, you know, so we will only use the, the, the market related rent. Um, so we will discount anything that's considered above market. Um, and, and, and we will really get to that via the or through the formal um, valuation process, you know, because and, and it's simple. I mean, there's comparable uh, rentals for every area, so we will know exactly whether it is market related or not. So that's that's always the first starting point. What is your gross rate? Thereafter, we will obviously subtract your, your operating expenses um, and, and, and we'll um, it's, it's all the operating expenses that's not 
uh, recovered from tenants, you know, so that could be things like insurance, taxes, utilities, security, maintenance, etc., etc., you know, anything that you are not recovering from your um, tenant. Um, I think, again, at this point, it's important to point out um, we are now talking cash flows that are available to service debt. So we will only use actual rental income at the moment and actual expenses. So if there is a vacancy um, in a property, which uh, a lot of um, income producing properties at this point has or have, we, 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 will, um, we, we will not assess the cash flows based on a fully occupied basis. We will look at it like it is now, the actuals. If that property is tenanted down the line and those vacancies are full, by all means, we, we are very happy to then increase the, the amount that we will lend against the property. But if we assess a deal on day one, we will only look at the cash flows that are available on day one. So, um, yeah, so I think that's just quite important because we, we, we often find people that say that the property could produce it, but when we deal with actual cash flows, we can only deal with what the property is currently producing. Anyway, uh, enough about that. So um, we've now established what the gross income is. We've established what the, the, the operating costs are. Um, and, and by subtracting the one from the other, we, we now get to a net position, you know, net cash flows that are available to service debt um, from the property. Uh, I think another thing that not um, everybody realizes is that that net rent that's available, we will discount that by a further minimum 20%. Um, now, a lot of people say to me that's quite harsh, and, and I suppose it is because effectively we, we take 20% of your cash flow and we say we're not even going to look at it. Um, but consider that we had a 50 year low um, on interest rates, and, and uh, you all know what goes down must come up again, and, and vice versa. And, and that 20% is really to make provision for future. Um, interest rate increases, you know, so by allowing um, as a minimum 20% uh, discount on, on that net cash, uh, you can rest assured and, and, and we can sleep at night because we'll both know that uh, interest rates can go back to 9-10% and you'll still be able to afford your, um, your installments on a monthly basis. So yeah, that now that we know what um, oh and, and and maybe just a last uh, comment around that uh, discount that we'll apply uh, we will we will always consider uh, the sustainability and the predictability of the cash flows out of that property now where do we get that we get that by looking at the tenant mix I mean, uh, I, I think what uh, COVID has pointed out, um, uh, and, and it's never been different before, it's, it's, it's just really um, sort of accentuated the point, is that certain tenants are, are, are more prone to pay you than others. I mean, uh, at the moment, for instance, if you've got a lot of nightclub in your property, you know, um, they're still not open to, they, they're still not allowed to trade, you know, so they're not going to pay you. Whereas if you had a food retailer, you probably would have had a paying tenant throughout the, the uh, you know, the, the last 18 months or whatever we've had this um, pandemic. So, 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 so based purely on the, on the industry that the tenant is, uh, operates in, and we'll look at things at how long has he been around, you know, uh, what is his payment history like? Um, you know, and, and, and that assists us to, to, uh, to form an opinion to say, you know, what is the likely, likeliness of this client, of this tenant to continue paying into the future and to stay in the property. And, and, and all those things in the mix of the, uh, obviously the tenant mix um, is just as important. And, and that'll give us an, 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 we'll form an opinion as to the, the, the sustainability and the predictability of the, the cash flows coming out of the property. And, and based on that, we'll apply, uh, apply certain discounts. Um, but yeah, as a rule of thumb, uh, we, we, we start at 20%. Um, exceptional cases, it may be lower um, and not so exceptional that it may be higher. Um, 
So now that we've established what the net rent is, we essentially uh, know what um, the instalment is that can be afforded. And all you really now need is a financial calculator. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and you can see that we, we haven't spoken anything credit here. This is still a, a, an accounting calculation if you want. Um, you know, we, we know what the instalment is. Uh, as far as the term is concerned, you know, it, it depends again on the type of property, the lease expiry profile, uh, the letability, the saleability. These are all things that comes out of the uh, formal valuations. Um, but generally speaking, again, as a rule of thumb, you know, 10 years on commercial property and, and up to 15 years on, on uh, investment residential type properties. Um, yeah, so we, we put a term into the financial calculator. The, the, the interest rate, again, it's dependent on the risk profile of the transaction. You know, it depends to what level you want to get it. it uh, these, it's different for every property and for every client. It depends on the prevailing market conditions. Um, I think uh, so fair enough to say at the moment uh, that, that we're in line with market um, rates, you know. Uh, um, I don't think any bank is particularly more expensive or less expensive when it gets to um, interest rates, you know. Uh, that's just the way market forces ensures that. Um, the instalment, uh, we know what it is because we know what the net rent is. I just can maybe add that, you know, we, we, we can add interest only periods. Um, we do so sometimes when a client wants a period to, to occupy a building maybe, or to maybe he's busy with renovations, you know, we won't be collecting full uh, rent. Um, but essentially that uh, we, we can sculpt the repayment to follow the cash flow. So, so if it is that we need a, uh, a year or two years, even two years in, in exceptional cases, uh, interest only period where you only have to service interest and only thereafter do you start servicing uh, or repaying capital. Um, that is that is also uh, possible. Um, right, and, and uh, if you know a financial calculator, if you plug in those four things, you know, the, the instalment, the term, um, the interest rate, uh, it'll give you the the amount, the present value, um, the amount that we can finance. And and yeah, and I mean, that amount is tantamount to the loan to value. Uh, you know, most people start and they ask you, what, what, what percentage will you give me on this? And what percentage will you give me on that? Uh, I don't know. Um, it depends on the cash flows that are available to service debt. And, and, and I think you'll hear this as a common theme throughout today's discussion. Um, that should always be the driving force in, in financing a property, is the cash flows that are available to service debt. But yeah, um, if you apply the cash flows correctly, um, like I've just described, and, 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 and obviously a bank is a bit more conservative than, than uh, probably when you would do your own calculations, um, you will get to an amount, and, and I can tell you from past experience, if, if we're realistic in our calculations around the cash flows, the, the loan to values or the LTVs will follow automatically. They will be correct. Um, it, but again, you know, as a rule of thumb, it, it could be anything from 50% 50, 50 to 70%. Um, in, an, in exceptional cases, it, be, it may be lower. It may be higher. Um, it, it really it depends on a whole lot of things. But, but, but ultimately, we will start at the cash flow and the, and the loan to value will follow. Um, just maybe one thing that I want to mention quickly, and I don't want to go on too long before we get to more specific questions, is that just be aware that, at, especially in the current market, um, there's, there's often a, a, a difference between uh, the purchase price of a property, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a willing buyer and a willing seller, you know, so the, the straight out purchase price compared to uh, the formal market value that you may get when you do a, um, you know, these discounted cash flow calculations on, on, on the cash flows that comes out of the property. Now, very often at the moment, um, the discounted cash flow calculation is, is actually higher than the purchase price. Um, and it's just because of the market where we are at the moment. You know, in a lot of properties, there are 
Um, there's surplus properties in the market, which drives down the price, you know, it's supply and demand. It's really as simple as that. Um, but the banks will always use the lower of the two. So if if you if you paying 10 million rand for a property and an evaluer come and he, and he tells you the property is worth uh, 15 million, well, well done, you, you, you did a good deal. But I can tell you now the bank will, will only use 10 million as the valuation. So yes, we'll, we'll use the, the cash flow to determine um, what amount we will get to, but we will still have a cap. Um, make no mistake, we will still say, uh, let's call it 56 or 65 percent, sorry, in, in, in this example. So we will still only say we'll do 65 percent of the 10 million um, and not of the 15 million. And, and, and the reasoning is simple. What you pay today is what that property is worth today. You know, that is the true market value. That's the first thing. And the second uh, thing, um, bear in mind that that when you get a, a, a formal valuation on a property from an expert valuator or a qualified valuator, they will only apply um, a marginal um, allowance for vacancies. So they normally do up to 5%. Um, whereas uh, in most instances where you pay below that perceived market value is because the vacancies are higher than 5%. You know, the vacancies may be 10 or 15, whatever the case may be. Um, so, 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 so when you do the deal, we work on actuals. Um, yes, the property may be worth more in the future, but that's fine. You know, somewhere in the future, we're quite happy to reconsider the value, especially if there's been vacancies and it's been full. And, and then you could get more against that property. But but on day one, we'll treat the purchase price as the value. Any case, so so, so, so I've, uh, I've spoken a lot. I, I want to hand over to my uh, colleague, Paul. And, and, and now, Paul, um, you, you will immediately, when you see Paul, you will realize that, that I have the looks. But if you listen to him, you'll hear that he's got the brains. Um, uh, Paul, do you, do you quickly want to, uh, just all the attendees, um, chat to them about what information uh, we generally need when we uh, when we consider financing a property. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Theo. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, Paul Haslow from uh, the Durban team. Um, yeah, just to, uh, it's kind of, I think the, the theme of our entire uh, presentation this morning is cash flow, cash flow and how to ensure that you have sufficient cash flow to um, ensure that you can you can service your your obligations um, and and it doesn't and and the property you're buying doesn't end up uh, kind of strangling you um, so the information required is really is two parts we have the uh, softer kind of information and then the i call it static um, which is the uh, names, addresses, the application form, your ID, uh, the SIPSI uh, details, as in uh, the details of the CC or the company, or the um, trustee letter of authority, depending on how you actually looking to buy or what entity you're looking to buy the property in. Um, the in, in, in our world, the, the soft stuff can be really, really important. Um, I had a deal the other day where if you looked at it on, on flat paper, if you just looked at the, um, the the rental schedule, it was a really smallish supermarket that wasn't a national brand. It's a, it's a family owned business. Um, but if you actually went into the, if you actually went into the information, you would find out that this family have been in those premises since 1965. So this is what I'm trying to, uh, kind of go to with the softer information. It's it's around finding out um, who's in the property, what they're in the property, how long they've been in the property for. Um, you know, there's a lot of softer issues that we need and that can help you get the funding exactly in the same way as a um, lease agreement or the rental schedule can. Um, the difference though, is that when we're putting the deal to credit, knowing who you are, knowing the property, knowing details around the property, 
so it become it comes to your sort of we we need we need the KYC in our world of you, you need the KYC uh, in your world of the property, which we then obviously move on to the, the credit team. The, um, the general information required, I mean, is, is, is relatively, uh, yeah, relatively simple, I guess. And then putting it together is, is how, we, how we need you to help us. Um, things like the uh, income and expenditure analysis, I mean, the uh, details we require around the tenants is, uh, you know, the who they are, the area they're occupying, the term of the lease, um, the uh, renewal options, um, the expiry date, uh, escalations, and then the gross rental. So these are all they they they're all pretty simple um, things to get. There's lease agreements. You can obviously refer to those, and often the the seller will give you all that information anyway. A lot of the information that people don't give you is around the expenses, um, rates, electricity, the insurance, rental collection, all those sort of things that are a little bit more subjective. And uh, the bank will apply market related unless we can actually get the actual um, details, which are, are able you are able to get from the seller. Um, and then there's various other things like your general maintenance. Um, people will leave out the air conditioning system. Um, that's got to have a maintenance contract attached to it, the lift if there's one, and then just general general um, information. The static information that we need is generally um, an information schedule for the purchaser. And now with our new KYC rules, we actually need to get all the way to a warm body. Um, it sounds... Um, strange but if you are buying the property in a in an entity and the entity is owned by a trust we then need to end up with whoever the um, trustees and the beneficiaries are of the trust so that's uh, so that's a person that's a warm body so we need all that information um, it sounds um, excessive but this is the new the new reality of, of where we are in terms of getting the required information uh, for uh, loaning uh, funds now. The um, the general static information of financials, um, bank account details, so the um, bank statements, and then the one thing I haven't mentioned obviously is a copy of the purchase agreement, um, which is, is critical to um, us understanding exactly what is um, happening with between you and, and and the seller. And as Theo pointed out, we then, we wouldn't base our valuation on the, on the purchase agreement. We would look at the rental schedule, look at the cash flows, and then look at the at the property itself, determine the, the cap rate, and, and we would base our uh, loan that we would offer based on the market value that we determine. The, question that's often asked is if you're an entrepreneur is it possible because I think a lot of people think a uh, pay slip is the the way that you know that's the easy way to prove your income but generally in our world we're looking at the cash flows off the property so um, the personal cash flows are, are a lot less relevant they are relevant we want to know them and we want to understand who you are as a, as a as our client but um, obviously we rely a lot more on the on the cash flows that are are coming from the actual property itself. But we would need um, your proof of income, your financials for your business, um, and where the financials are older than six months, obviously management accounts to date. The, the balance of the information is, is really static and you would be familiar with that. The IDs, copy of marriage certificates, um, that sort of thing. Where we um, are able to, you know, we, we're able to get a lot, of, I mean, everybody has that, we're able to get that from you quite simply. So in, in any deal, the, the key for us is understanding the property and then understanding you, the purchaser. So it's the softer issues that we often look to as well. The, the valuation and everything else drives the amount and all the rest, but we really need to understand the circumstances and what you're looking to do. Um, are you building a property portfolio? Is it a one-off? There's a lot of information that's soft that we need to be able to, to, to garner from you in order to put a, a really good uh, credit app together. 
because if we don't have that kind of the softer information nowadays, it's going to, we're going to need it. And then what happens is it just delays the process slightly. So most of our consultants will ask you for a lot of that information. They will have conversations with you, I think is a better way of putting it, where they understand who you are and what you're trying to achieve. Um, and that heads towards the whole advice aspect of our of our business. Yeah, Theo, so it, it's we can obviously answer more questions as we go, um, and hopefully people will ask around these um, points that we've made, and we can um, build a little bit on on the scenarios. And maybe we can get to some live live scenarios yeah. now where I saw there was a question around a residential property. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, let's maybe uh, deal with the um, uh, questions that's been published. Um, so the, the, the first question was um, for uh, investment residential property, um, where finance is required on a, on a vacant, um, well, the property is vacant and it needs to be refurbished. Um, how do you access this, uh, assess the size of the loan? Um, yeah, I, I think that's a very fair question and, and, and welcome to our life. <laughs> you know, the, the, the short answer is with difficulty. Um, uh, but uh, <laughs> seriously, uh, though, we, um, it again boils down to the cash flow, you know, and, 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 and I'm going to sound like, a, I don't know, like I'm repeating myself. But, but ultimately, we would need to know what can be generated out of that property um, as, re as net rental income um, to determine what bond it can service. Now, now yes, we will um, assist in, in, in finance, uh, uh, financing the re refurbishment costs. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, our valuations will also give you an, an, an what we call a, a on, con on completion um, value, you know, so you maybe you maybe you bought it maybe for two million rand, and you and you spend a million rand. So you would hope that the, the on completion value would be three million rand. You know, uh, uh, believe it or not, it's not always the case, and, and sometimes it goes to five million rand. Who knows? Uh, um, but yeah, the the, uh, the 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 big thing is uh, is around um, serviceability. Now. Obviously, whilst it's vacant, it's not generating income, you know, so we would need to go and, and look at our client behind uh, the transaction. And that's why it's important that, that we have as much as possible um, information that Paul alluded to. But also, it is easier to make those decisions for for clients that, that's got a track record with the bank, you know, so if you bank with an with a bank it makes that decision so much easier you know so that is why we always uh, i mean we, we we love to have more business of our clients but one of the reasons behind it is it it makes it easier to make those um, sort of uh, discussions you know so so assuming that you can afford at least say the interest on that loan um uh, the, that you're asking about, you know, it could be structured that you only have to service interest until the refurbishment is finished and that you only then start repaying it. Um, we would also, you may also um, have a, uh, a potential uh, tenant, you know, so uh, if you've got somebody that's willing to sign a, a lease on the property, um, uh, you know, based on what it's going to be after the refurbishment is finished, um, I know that's not always uh, practical, uh, well, practically possible in the market. But, you know, these are all sort of things that uh, that, that we will look at. Um, so yeah, in in, in short, uh, it falls back on cash flows. You know, how is it going to be serviced um, whilst the refurbishment period is going on, and afterwards, what would the market-related rent be that you could get from the property, um, and what would that be able to service in terms of a, a a bond. I mean, I, 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 I hope I answered your question. Um, just maybe whilst we're on the topic of, of, of financing the refurbishments and um, and developments, uh, you know, we, we, we also often get the question as to whether we finance developments. Um, and, and, and the answer is again, yes, but selectively. Um, you know, we uh, we, we are ultimately a, a private wealth business. Um, 
you know, so the majority of developments are done through net bank property finance, which sits in our corporate um, and investment banking division. Um, but we do do um, uh, development finance. You know, we we um, uh, our biggest. I don't want to use the word constraint, but we will we, we will look at the complexity of the the development. Um, you know, we, we we do not necessarily have a cap as far as the amount is concerned, um, but we we've got only so much capacity from a from a back office point of view because we're a, a, a private wealth business, not a um, you know a big corporate finance um, type business. You know, so if if you come to us and you say I want to I want to finance or I want to develop five or six or ten uh, residential units for argument's sake, by all means we can assist you. Uh, you know, if you come to me and you say you want to you want to develop 200 uh, of these things, I'm probably going to refer you to our, to our property finance business. Um, but assuming that we're happy with it, you know, we will follow the same process. Um, I think that that most banks um, uh, follow in that um, our normal considerations will first of all be pre-sales you know so uh, we would want to know that you could by selling the units we could trade out of the fine finance and I think it's it's important for you and for the bank um, that we know that you can repay the debt that you take on um, if the property is going to be retained and it's going to be uh, tenanted um, you know by third parties um, or by yourself maybe uh, we, we, we would want to see some form of intent from those tenants that say I will take, I will occupy that space um, once it's fully developed. Um, because again, you know, that, that will tell us something about the cash flows going forward and it will give us that comfort of, of the sustainability and the predictability of the cash flows going forward. So yeah, um, the first consideration will always be pre-sales or leases. Um, either signed or, or, or um, letters of intent from tenants, um, then we would want to make sure that there are professional teams involved. You know, that are, uh, we, we, we don't want these bucky builders like they call them. You know, we want to make sure that, uh, that you're dealing with uh, qualified and registered um, people. I mean, and again, I think we will all agree it's for, the, uh, it's for your safety and it's for the bank's safety. Um, uh, turning to the numbers, uh, we, we, we generally will give you 50% um, of the land value up front um, that you can, uh, that will give you just once the bond is registered, you know, and that 50% can hopefully, um, not hopefully, it will kickstart uh, the development cost. Um, and then we, we, we'll do up to 70% of the, of the um, development costs thereafter, of the building costs, if you want. Um, I must point out that that excludes VAT, you know, for those who've done developments, you'll know that that's quite a contentious issue um, because these days you wait a bit for your VAT um, uh, from the receiver, but uh, we understand that's also getting better, you know, so but yeah, that, that 70, 80 percent level is, is, is ex-VAT. Um, yeah, and, 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 the, and the money will be uh, made available on progress draws and it will always be on a cost to completion basis what we call you know we've we've got all these jargon in the banks but but cost to completion essentially means that your money goes in first um, you know so if if a project costs 100 rand to develop you will put we'll do 70 rand you'll do your 30 rand first and the bank 70 rand will follow and we will always make sure that the amount that's still available under the bond is sufficient to finish the building project. You know, because the last thing you want to do is you want to get to the end and, uh, you know, <laughs> you don't have a roof, but the, the bond is fully drawn, you know. So, uh, yeah, um, and, and, and those those draws are made based on, on quantity surveyor support uh, uh, reports and architects and engineers that sign off and whatever. I want to, don't want to go into the detail. But we'll make sure that um, uh, in line with you that uh, if we pay out, uh, you know, it's safe to pay out. Um, so, so that was just around um, uh, kind of development finance. Um, I see another question here around um, just maybe structures. 
you know, how does the size of a loan work when each property is in its own company structure and the ultimate of these companies is a trust. Um, again, you know, the, the structure does not change the, the financial fundamentals behind the transaction. So, so you can have 100 properties in 100 different companies. Uh, there's, there's the one way of looking at it is that each company will get its own, own loan over its own property. But again, it will be driven through the cash flows available from that specific property to finance or repay the debt in that company. That's one way of looking at it. So where each one is done on its own, or you can take a, a bigger view and have a portfolio view, what we call. You know, it is possible to register um, and to do a loan over all, in this instance, 100 uh, properties, even if it's in 100 different companies. Um, you can do one loan over all those properties. And the benefit that you get from that is that one property may have a particular stronger cash flow than others. You know, so you may want a situation where uh, a property in company A is able to subsidize a property in company B. You know, so that is also uh, possible. You know, if, if it's got the same ultimate shareholder, uh, you can do those things, you know, um, we, we, we uh, at Nepang Private Wealth, we try to be as flexible as possible and to structure, that's why we call ourselves structured lending, is to structure the debt that it suits your cash flows and your um, particular needs. I hope that has answered, um, answered uh, your question around that. Paul, um, I, I also had a question um, from somebody around uh, the costs uh, of buying uh, properties these days. Um, do you want to touch on that uh, for us? Yeah. The, the, just to on, on that last question, um, we we do do a lot where somebody's got a portfolio of properties, we revalue those, generate the equity off those, which is to Theo's point about um, the portfolio of properties. And then we use that equity to, to fund the next property and then bond it or, or fund the deposit of the next property. But obviously, as Theo has said, it's all based on the cash flows and then you are subs subsidizing one property with the other. Um, the, then just to go to that question that we've been asked around um, the uh, cost of, of um, funding a property, I think um, the part that's probably the um, the biggest cost to everybody when you're funding a property is time. Uh, we all, our, our time is important. Our time is, uh, yeah, it's costly. You know, if, you, if you're looking at a property, you're not doing something else that may be generating your income. Um, so it's the it's the DD, the due diligence that you need to put in and um, and and it's you know, going, looking at the property, talking to people, finding out about the property. So that's really one of the costs that people don't really look at too much. Um, and it, it it takes quite a lot of time to to get um, through the, um, the, I guess, the due diligence, the DD process um, and get the information required to present the deal to a bank or an institution like ourselves. Um, traditionally, as um, Theo has pointed out, uh, the other big cost, the really big cost is, is banks would tend to do uh, sort of somewhere between 60, 70 on commercial industrial property, 60, 70% loan to value. Um, on, on residential and investment properties, it, it'll, it'll go up. You could um, get to 80, even higher than that um, as, as a loan to value. So then your deposit comes down. But, um, you know, obviously on a, on a 20 million rand uh, commercial or industrial property, you know, you're looking, you're looking at a, at a sizable rand value to pay the deposit, and that's why we keep referring to the portfolio of properties where we can look at other properties you hold, uh, which may be able to uh, provide the collateral as as the deposit. So effectively, the next property we would fund 100%, 30% from your portfolio, and 70 or 60% on the actual property itself, depending on the cash flows. So those are um, those are ideas you need to explore, and um, hopefully you can chat to Theo and myself, our teams, and, and have a look at those options. The other cost, obviously, is the interest rates. 
Um, everything seems to be trending around prime, 7% at the moment. Residential obviously runs down a little bit uh, into the prime minuses, as does um, the good commercial, the, the good commercial industrial property. You would um, be able to negotiate those rates down slightly. Um, a normal valuation fee would be is another cost, obviously pre um, the uh, funding, anywhere between seven and twenty five thousand, I would guess, uh, plus VAT. Depending on the market value, it is on a sliding scale or a tiered uh, scale, um, and uh, that's something that pretty much every purchase um, would require. We generally would require a new valuation anywhere between six and 12 months if the last one is between six and 12 months old. Given, as Theo pointed out earlier, how things have changed radi radically in the last little bit, um, the idea is, is to is to relook at those uh, properties. The um, other costs that are um, that obviously are standard now is your bond registration costs. Um, a 5 million Rand bond will cost you about 64,000 Rand in total, roundabout. Uh, that's before any discounts or, or, or um, concessions offered. Uh, the transfer duty is also on a tiered on a tiered scale. So here, um, the it's 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 um, there's a, there's a few scenarios. If you're buying a commercial industrial property and you VAT registered and the seller's VAT registered and uh, there's an existing tenant, you can obviously buy the property as a going concern and there you would pay VAT at 0%. I know it sounds weird to pay something at 0%, but it's that's the rate. It's not that you're not paying VAT, you're paying it at naught. Um, and uh, otherwise, um, if um, the seller is, is VAT registered and you're not, there's going to be a 15% uh, of the purchase price payable in VAT. Um, if um, you are, if you're both non, uh, not VATed, then there would be transfer duty payable um, on a 5 million Rand purchase price this time, not the bond. Uh, you looking at about, uh, the transfer duty is about 366,000. So it's quite a lot of money um, and that's why obviously we need to have those funds available uh, to use when when uh, looking at considering a purchase price. Uh, generally banks on on the purchase of a property on, on, on the actual facility on commercial industrial property, there would be a 1% initiation fee or a, a service fee uh, up front. Um, if um, you've got other properties, then it softens the blow because you could transfer from there. But generally, these funds need to be if you're doing a purchase and it's a finite amount, you would need to have these funds up front. And then the other one, as the, the, the question was around repairs and maintenance and uh, TI uh, tenant installation. If you've got a new tenant, uh, you're going to have to negotiate with the tenant as to what you will pay and what uh, the tenant will pay. Often what happens is you pay for the um, the TI or the tenant installation up front, and then you add it into the rental. So you're getting it back over a period, which again means that you've got to have capital up front to do the, the changes or the, and it can be simple things like tiling or putting in a new lift or um, the big one at the moment that we seem to have a lot of people having to do is the um, fire systems, the um, sort of like an irrigation system, I guess, that people have to put into uh, a lot of the buildings. Uh, otherwise, they won't get insurance. Um, and this you can obviously claim back through the rental, but um, that's something you'd have to negotiate. And as I said earlier, you would have to have those funds up front. Um, and it, it can be uh, quite a lot to consider when you're looking at a purchase of a property. Thanks, Theo. Yeah. OK, thanks a lot. Um uh, Paul, there, there, there was a question around whether the bank will fund um, the due diligence and the, and the feasibility studies. Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> the, 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 the longer answer is maybe. Um, you know, the, uh, we, we, we do allow for, for some of the deal costs um, to be capitalized into the loan. In, in, in other words, uh, instead of lending you 5 million Rand will lend you 5.2 million Rand to allow um, for certain of the deal fees. Um, normally, though, 
um, the deal fees are uh, around valuation costs and and raising fees and those sort of things. So uh, as a rule, I would say no, the, 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 the banks will generally not finance due diligence um, simply because you do that up front. Uh, remember, by you, when you're still doing that, uh, that DD, you haven't decided that you'll finance the property. You know, so if you decide you finance the property, we could consider to have that part of the um, the fees. But uh, it, 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 again, it, it depends on how much you want to fi finance overall, who's who's behind the deal, um, those sort of things. You know, uh, there's there's no yes or no on on a fee like a DD fee to be financed. Um, I hope that answers your question, Kiran. Um, uh, uh, there's also another question from, from Magda, if you bonded two or three properties in, in one loan and use the money to invest in another, how does it work when you decide to sell one of them? Um, it's not a problem. Uh, the, the bank simply agrees to, to have the property that you, um, that you uh, sold to be removed from the bond. Uh, you know, so our, our bond will only be over the remaining uh, properties. What is important is that obviously, if if part of the bank is security is is uh, released, um, then we would also want to see a uh, reduction, uh, a permanent reduction, I should say, in the loan amount. You know, so there will be a negotiation between you and the bank to say that I've sold this one property, so I want it released, and the bank will say, that's fine, we'll release it, but we need X amount from the sale proceeds of that property. And it doesn't necessarily have to be um, the full amount. You know, it depends what the remaining properties are worth. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I hope that has uh, answered your question around that. Um, we, we, we're almost coming to an end, Paul. Um, I see we've got like eight minutes left. Um, the, there was another question around um, uh, uh, the impact of COVID on, on, on purchasing properties. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually a very broad subject and I suppose, you know, everybody has got their own opinions. Um, I, I can only talk to what I've seen, you know, and, and it, it, it really depends on the type of of property that you're referring to, you know, because it's uh, the, the impact has been different to different types of uh, uh, properties. Um, you know, uh, again, um, it speaks to uh, uh, the predictability and the sustainability of cash flows, um, irrespective of what type of properties uh, you have. Um, I can maybe just add, you know, there's a there's a term, I don't know who coined it, but um, the, the, they talk about ghost um, vacancies and it is simply where uh, you you may have a, a, a very nice uh, corporate tenant, say in a in an office block, for instance. Um, they're not occupying it because they're all working from home. Um, and and that, that piece of uh, that area that they occupied is not considered as vacant because there's a lease over it. Um, but the reality is that they will that they will not renew that lease, you know, so uh, and, and I suppose that's where the term ghost comes from, because it, it may theoretically be occupied now and they're paying you, but we all know when that lease comes to an end in six months time for argument's sake, they're not going to renew it. So it, it may not be seen as vacant now, but it, it's definitely going to become vacant. Um, so, so, so that's the one thing that I think you, you, you need to keep in mind, you know, that uh, you're buying a property now and it may be tenanted, but are they going to renew? And more importantly, at what level are they going to renew, uh, 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 renew, you know, in terms of the rate per square meter? Um, we, we, the, there's been a lot of regression in, 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 uh, in, in rates um, and it's, you know, it's supply and demand. Um, I mean, you, you you look at office space. There's there's just simply uh, the 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 problem is really just that there's too much office space. You know, the the the, the supply outstrips the demand, and and that's why office spaces has been struggling, and 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 why uh, 
um, you know, you, you, I don't think you're going to see new office space developments um, going up uh, in the new in new future or new uh, new plans being approved. I should I, I suppose I I should say it's it's simply because these the the existing supply can't be um, filled. You know, so yeah. Whereas on on the other hand, I mean, uh, I think it's quite a, a well known fact that um, residential property sort of below the the, the one and a half million, but especially below the million rand mark is doing excep exceptionally well. Um, and it's it's again, it's simply because inter low interest rates has made it cheaper to pay off a bond than what you would have paid if you rented the property. You know, so a lot of people are buying that, that apartment instead of renting it because it's cheaper to buy it. And remember, the first million rand is, is free of transfer duties. Um, so, so yeah, but again, just remember that interest rates will go up again at some point, you know, and uh, if you haven't made provision for that in your budgeting process, uh, you, you're going to burn your fingers um, because it, if the rates go up, it may, it may become more expensive to repay a bond than it would be to rent the property. You know, so yeah, uh, s s all in all, um, you know, uncertainty, uh, uncertainty isn't good for any investment uh, class and, and property is no different. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, the, the, there's been some encouraging signs. Um, I mean, I, I read the other day for those of you, I think everybody knows uh, Sandton City. I mean, I. Uh, there was an article in the press, um, I think last week, that said Sandton City, um, as a as a shopping mall, had the biggest um, uh, turnover month. You know, by just simply adding the turnover or the revenue of all the tenants, that it's had uh, the, the month of March 2021 was the highest turnover month for the shopping centre as a whole um, in the last in the past five years. You know, so that's quite something. Um, I'm not too sure what's driving it. I think a lot of it was uh, more luxury type uh, um, uh, outlets, but but the fact that it's the highest in five years, which is which is quite something if you consider where we are in in terms of this whole pandemic. You know, so so it's not doom and gloom. Remember, property is a is a is a long term investment and. Um, you know, uh, uh, over the long term, it, it's it's given real um, returns. You know, inflation beating returns, and 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 we will get back to that. And and, and now is a good time to buy. I mean, if he, well, any time is a good time to buy if you can buy at the right price. Um, you know, so uh, but but I think now particularly there are there are decent deals in the market. Um, as long as you keep that cash flow uh, in the back of your mind and and remember that uh, it's only a good buy if you can afford it. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I think we've run out of time. Um, uh, I really want to thank you for, 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 for dialing in. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you and thanks for those who've asked the questions. And um, uh, please remember that um, you can go to our website and, and, and you can see, uh, you, you can find previous webinars um, and you can see upcoming ones um, and you'll find a recording of this one. Um, I mean, if, if you need to get in touch uh, with us, you can send an email to, to the email address, the, the contact at NetBank Private Wealth, um, and we'll contact you because, you know, this is not ideal. Uh, it's, it's better than nothing, but it, it, we, we would far better uh, prefer speaking to you on a one-on-one on -one -on -one basis. and. Um, uh, and, and if we can help you, we, we really would. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, please also remember that there will be a, a, um, a uh, short uh, feedback if you can give it to us. Um, uh, that will um, help us for future. Um, and that's it. So uh, thank you very much and, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, thanks to you as well, Paul.